Thank you, Lord, for this group of people. Thank you for your work. Thank you for what you're doing. I'm so grateful for the beautiful day you've given us. Thank you that spring is beginning to arrive. I pray, Lord, as we continue to pursue this idea of being the manifold wisdom of God that is seen not just to the world, but also as an expression to all of those influences of hell that, God, we can take hold of exactly what you would have us to be. And I praise and worship you in Jesus' name, and everybody say amen. amen. I love you. Bless you. You can be seated. Um, real quick, for those of you who are part of Calvary, if you're our guest, don't fret about this, but uh, get on your Facebook app, and um, let's get your friends having church with us this morning. And um, it really does work. Um, Look up Calvary, UPC, Springfield, get it open, and then that service, wow, I look better on camera than I do in the mirror. Hit share, and uh, it will be there for all of your friends uh, to see. And I encourage you to do this for every service. You have many friends who... Um, are not ready to come to church, um, but they are interested. Many, many people uh, will have watched church for many services before they ever um, make their physical presence known. And uh, this, is, this is a great opportunity. It's a great way to, to share and to connect with people. Now, I need to do quite a bit of review today. We have folk who have not been here um, this, this little journey began with uh, uh, Ephesians chapter 3. And Ephesians chapter 3 deals with the uniqueness of the church. And uh, in that, one of the things that's said about it is that the church, the church is this body of called out believers. That this body of called out believers, this individuals, we're, we're each unique, we're each special, God has made us fearfully and wonderfully, each of us unique, but we come together and are coming together as being called out believers, called out uh, people with faith in, in Christ, people who are obedient to him. The scripture in Ephesians talks about how that to those in heavenly places, and it uses that term principalities and powers, which is a reference to unclean spirits, a reference to those things that are that uh, are in opposition, satanic influence, all of those demonic things, etc. That the church is to those entities the manifold wisdom of God. Now we don't use the word manifold very often, particularly not as it's used in that passage, but it means the multivariegated. And again, that's a, a word or phrase that we don't use. But uh, the, the, the picture of it would be this. Remember the kid's kaleidoscope, where that you turn it, and every time you turn it, there's a different look. Well, that's what is being communicated by that term, the multivaricated, or the manifold wisdom of God, that when Satan and all of his followers look at the church, they see the wisdom of God as though it were a kaleidoscope for each of you, every person who is here, every person who's ever been part of the church of the living God comes to him in their own unique way. None of us have exactly the same story. None of us follow exactly the same path. So your salvation, your being who and what you are in Christ is an expression of the variegated wisdom of God. People and Satan and those that are his followers, they see the work of God. They see the church as an expression of God. That's one of the reasons it's extremely important that we represent him well. The church matters, not simply because we exist, 
but because we are doing the things that matter to him, the things that are important to him, things that have value to him. And, of course, the priority of why Christ came, he came to seek and to save that which was lost. And so the ultimate purpose, the ultimate objective is reaching the lost and seeing them matured into disciples of Christ. I'm grateful for those that were baptized last Sunday. I celebrate, I rejoice, always have, always will. But I rejoice much more when I see those people who have been converted and they're singing in the praise team, or they're playing a musical instrument, or they're teaching a Sunday school class, or they are helping on the ushering staff, or they're teaching somebody else a home Bible study. Why? Because we are not commissioned. As a matter of fact, the end product of the church is not converts. The end product of the church is disciples. There are many people who will have been converted who will not make it to heaven. But disciples of Christ, those who continue to follow Him and grow in Him, will experience salvation. So uh, when I worked with church planners for several years, I tried to instill in them the concept that really a church has two ministries. The two ministries are get them here and keep them here. And I read somewhere, this was several years ago, and I want you to think about this. I read that 75% of the activity of the average local church could be eliminated and it not in any way affect the spiritual health or the evangelistic effort of that local church. Think about it. Now, think critically not just thinking about, boy, we enjoy such and such, but think critically about the desired outcome. Lost, saved, saved, discipled. And if that becomes the measure, if those two things become the criteria that we're measuring and qualifying by, then suddenly some of the things that we do, and this is not just Calvary, this is everywhere. 75% of what the average church does. And uh, it's kind of interesting. I got to think about it a few days ago. Uh, in our longest uh, tenured pastorate, the more years that we were involved there, the more years that we pastored, the fewer stuff, the less stuff we had on the calendar. And the less stuff I attended. I left it to to other folks. Um, Too many things, I I came to realize, kept us busy, but they didn't have any meaning. They didn't have any end result. They didn't, you know, I I got to looking at some of the things we did, and I realized there's nobody here that's lost. There's nobody here that's a recent convert that we're growing and maturing. So we're just kind of feeding into ourselves. We're you know, we're, we're kind of sitting around as, as the body of Christ and looking in each other's face and, and, and all of that. So when we consider the church's significance, not just in our neighborhood, not just in our community, but the reality that Satan and his minions see that the church, this church, this local church body, functions as expressing the kaleidoscope of God knowing what to do next. Best way to learn about anything, we went from there, was to go to the baseline. And in Acts 2, we see that those individuals who made up that first body of called out believers did a number of things as a priority. Number one, they were in fellowship. And fellowship is more than smiling to each other. Fellowship is more than just talking to each other at church. Fellowship for men might be going fishing together. Fellowship from it's outside the walls. Fellowship isn't what's here, it's how we connect to each other out there. Because that's where relationships are built. And people are not retained in the body of Christ without relationships. There has to be that entanglement with other people. The second thing that they gave themselves to 
is that they were teaching and they were being taught. And uh, it is mentioned as a priority. It's translated in the King James Version with the word doctrine. I like to use what is a better translation for at least our modern thinking. They were being taught. And in order to be taught, somebody was teaching them. Now, if I could just get off um, on a little tangent for a minute. Um, I'm in quite a few different churches these days and have done that on and off for, for several years, uh, almost two decades now. I find it appalling how often uh, the pastor just delegates the teaching session, if they have such on Sunday morning, to someone else. And in many instances, it's not even there. Because this is where we build people. This is where vision, this is where we become better for Christ. And again, just on a tangent, all of you who have heard me preach lately, and I've been in your church, I was talking to you. Change that. So, back. Okay, so taught. And we all like to be with people who are taught. Um, I wanted my school teachers to know what they were talking about. We have several people here who are nurses. Uh, Monique, not here today. Misty's not here today either. Um, they were taught. They went through extensive training, and then they were able to take action. If they had not been taught on what they were to do in those hospital rooms, they would never have been effective with it. Nobody would have ever hired them for that position. We want people to serve us who have invested themselves in being taught. Sometimes I hear people say, and you hear it too, I don't know how. How will I learn except you teach me? Now, I can sit down and say, I don't want to learn you do. Okay, the next time a similar problem arises, I'm no better off than I was in the earlier situation. I'm still looking to you or someone like you because I have not been improved. I have not made myself better. We are to be recipients of teaching of the Word of God. And then in Acts chapter 3, which was the last session I taught, individuals uh, who were some of those who made up that church moved into another level of showcasing the, another facet of the wisdom of God. And the analogy I use was a running engine. It is powerful, but it is accomplishing nothing. In order for it to do anything, in order for it to move anything, in order for it to go anywhere, there has to be an engagement. Action beyond ignition. Acts chapter 2 was the ignition of the church. But on this day in Acts chapter 3, Peter and John going to the temple. And Peter on his own initiative. And I, I, I emphasize that over and over again. Because too many times we're waiting on God to kick us in the shin and say do. Do. But there is no indication that God whispered anything to Simon Peter that day. He simply saw a lame man from birth sitting there. He began to talk with him, finally getting to silver and gold have I none, but in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth rise up and walk, taking the lame man by hand and lifting him. And in so doing, he moved ministry. See, he had several options. If Danny is the beggar sitting at the gate... He could have come by and dropped coins because that's what the man was there for, alms, alms. And to do so was a benefit to the man, but it was nothing more than a custodial benefit. It kept brain and body together. It kept him fed. But on this day, this Christian decided not to simply be a custodial Christian, but instead to become a transformational Christian. 
And so he took action. He allowed the power of the name of Jesus to work. And expecting it to work, he took that man by his hand and he lifted him up. I value the church custodial. It gets involved in social projects. It keeps the homeless fed and the beggars alive. And and, uh, there there are so many positive things that happen within social framework. But the church transformational changes the discourse because it eliminates the words lame and beggar from this man's biography. That's no longer the way you can describe him. You can look at somebody today and say, Joe is a lifelong addict to cocaine. And we can give him social help. I can counsel him, which doesn't seem to help much. Or we can anticipate that Joe can have a transformational experience with the Lord Jesus Christ that will deliver him from his addiction. I want us to be a friendly church. I want us to be uh, a church that people come to because they, they like what's going on. They like our music. They like preaching. They like the teaching. They like everything that's going on. But I don't want... There to simply be that, boy, they make good cookies. They have great social events. This needs to be a spot where when somebody needs God, or it needs to be a place where that we go from here, and when we encounter someone who needs God, we get engaged in their life, not simply for social reasons, but we get involved in their life with the expectation that they will be transformed. I don't think the devil and all his little minions that are in the stadiums are too worried about us baking good cookies. But now when people are being baptized, when people are being filled with the Holy Ghost, when people's lives are being changed, when the alcoholic is being set free, that's a different deal. Such were some of you. If we had the testimonies for a while, you have been transformed. Having been transformed, let's never become content to simply be part of a custodial work, maintenance, fellowship within. Let's don't don't do that. Now, all of that's review. So I've taken quite a bit of my time reviewing. Let me pause before I move on. And uh, any, any questions or comments? And for those of you who are guests today, this is just a norm for us. And I'm okay with any question you want to ask because I'm also very comfortable saying I don't know. And... Um, So you're not talking to a know-it-all because I don't know it all. Any questions, comments? Maybe a thought came to mind that you felt could be added to this. Okay. Now, we have seen the church in its formation, and we have seen the church go beyond ignition to engagement. Where we're going to move to today is uh, the church 35 years down the road, okay? So this is not in the early wakening moments of the New Testament church. And I'm going to use a verse, to some degree it's about out of context, but I think that the verse succinctly says what we're going to be able to see throughout the Scripture. If it doesn't, call my hand on it when we're through. But... uh, The book of 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, written by Paul to this body of believers in the Grecian city of Corinth, it's interesting, Paul spent exactly three months there planting a church. And then he left it and it began to grow. And uh, if you want to read about his time there, it's found in Acts chapter 20. But about five years later, Paul writes this first letter 
And this church that he had left behind, perhaps because of the, the short length of time that he had been there, had some chaotic problems. Um, one writer said uh, this was the, uh, the most Pentecostal of churches with the biggest problems. And in many ways, that was the case. They had big feasts celebrating communion, but if you were poor, you didn't get invited to the communion feast because you couldn't give one next week to invite others to. So really what they did is they brought their feast to other deities into their Christianity, and it just became kind of a atmosphere that the elite were but those who didn't have anything they they were they were just excluded and Paul of course addresses that it's all kind of carnality that's in the bunch they were just as carnal as dirt one of the issues that they were dealing with is known as the gifts of the spirit and the gifts of the spirit are given to the church for the edifying of the body of Christ and I'm not going to take time to teach on how the, how the gifts of the Spirit operate. But there are verbal gifts. There are verbal gifts that are private verbal gifts. The word of wisdom, word of knowledge. There are gifts of the Spirit that are power gifts. Gift of healing, gift of miracles. And then there are verbal gifts as well. Tongues, interpretation of tongues, and the word of prophecy. As Paul talks about these, and he's really teaching them about how to govern these. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 12, he includes this statement, and I want to draw it. He said, seek that ye may excel to the edifying of the church. I know that you're zealous of spiritual gifts. I know that you want to see power happen. I know that you want to see uh, these operations verbally and the word of wisdom, all the rest. You want that, but always desire it with there being a highlight, an underline, a bold in your pursuit of it. You're to only desire this in order that you can excel to the building up of the church. The word excel. Uh, in modern language, would probably be super abound. Paul wanted the Corinthian saints to excel. Everybody say excel, excel in the use of spiritual gifts. That phrase, seek to excel, seek to excel, seek to excel. The church at its best seeks to excel in everything it does. Because in our seeking to excel, and again I'll take you through the scripture in just a moment, show you where it's there over and over again. In our seeking to excel, these principalities and powers, the spectators that are watching the church, know that there is an intentionality in us that we are determined to do our very best for God. Now, if we don't renew ourselves in that pretty often, and in that mindset, we reach a point where that we become mediocre, and we become content with mediocrity. In the book of Malachi, it talks about how that there came a time in Israel where that they snuffed at the sacrifices that were to be brought to God. And instead of bringing him what he had asked for and expected, they would bring as sacrificial animals those that were lame or blind. They would give him something that was second best. And the Lord said, these things that you snuff at, these things that you turn your nose up at, these are things that I asked of you, I desired of you, I still want these from you, and I'm not tired of you giving me your best. And so the premise of settling in, and we all know uh, the experience, we probably all live the experience, of becoming so accustomed to the cobweb in the corner that we don't even see it any longer. 
And we can become so accustomed to just doing get by in our Christian life. Just surviving, just enduring. The lesson is seek to excel. What does it mean to excel in an area of life? I mentioned nurses already. Monique was out at the door. What does it mean for her to be an excellent nurse? Sam, I've commented on several times as being probably the best diesel mechanic in 50 or 100 miles around here. How do you become that? Why would it be that people who had a, a diesel engine that wasn't going right, and why, why would they call uh, the company he works for and say, now, I want Sam Carr to come work on my engine? Well, he's got three jobs ahead of you. I'll wait until he's available. Why would they do that? Why do I go to my barber and sit there and there's two empty chairs, but I'm waiting on him because these are people who excel at what they do. Joel's not here. He's a finished carpenter par excellence. Dennis and his plumbing business stays extremely busy. Several years ago, Tina in a singing contest, award winning for this entire area. Daniel as a soldier. Again, people being excellent at what they do. People excelling. Uh, Kevin's upstairs, I suppose, teaching youth. He is an exceptional teacher, now a principal of a school, eventually a school superintendent because he's pursuing his doctorate. What does it mean to excel in life? You don't get to just drop out of college and be asked to be the superintendent of schools. You have to have some training. You have to have some education. You have to apply yourself. You have to give yourself to it. Same for a nurse. Last night, my grandson was with me, and I've discovered that as grandkids get older, they get more and more expensive. <laughs> and this one at 16 is 6'8", six, and hollow legs and arms and everything else. So uh, he convinced me to go to uh, one of these Japanese steakhouses in town. And so we ate. And uh, after we had, after the guy had done all his little stuff and finished, and we, we were about through eating, uh, the, the chef said, I'm leaving, and somebody else come and clean. Well, the guy that came to clean the grill, all of us who were still sitting there, we watched this guy. And the grill's very hot, it's got all kind of gunk on it, been good with biscuits. He pours a little water, and he begins to scrape. Well, the little bit of water he puts on, it very quickly dries on the hot grill. In a minute, he's using every muscle he's got trying to scrape that gunk off the top, and it's not working. And he's pushing it up into the corners, and he's pushing the stuff up in the top where it's going to be hard to get out eventually. And uh, Caden leans over to me after a minute, and he said, he don't know what he's doing. They'll give me about three minutes. I can train him. He never cleaned a grill in his life. But it's just logic. It's just logic. You know, if the little hole where all the gunk's going to go is down here, you don't start cleaning right here. You start down there. And, well, this guy didn't have that part down. And I watched. It was painful. Was pain. Finally, I told him just as I was getting ready, I said, son, you've got a gallon of water there. Use that water. Pour a bunch of it on there. You say, well, that's his business. You don't need to bother other folks. You see this on my head? When you get some of this, you're the same way. You got some of this. You got it too. Here's the other part of getting this. You start losing. You got it too. You start losing some of your filters. <laughs> and you just jump in on stuff that's none of your business. And I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, this boy's going to be cleaning his grill for the next 90 minutes. Somebody don't help him. 
I, I was so tempted to say, if you'll give me that thing, let me scrape for about 15 I can show you how to do this. I don't know. It was obvious that nobody taught him how. He was not an excellent grill cleaner. Maintaining that current pace of life, he would not be a grill cleaner for very long. He'd be doing something else. But you know what? It really wasn't his fault. Whose fault it was is it was very obvious to me nobody had taught him how to do this. They had just assumed anybody with any sense knows how to clean a grill. Well, that's to assume anything is extremely dangerous. Okay? Now, let's move this just a little further. And I really do need your help with discussing this. If we're talking about being an exceptional Christian, an exceptional individual Christian. What are some of those characteristics, Bible-based characteristics? What are some things that you would expect to see in someone who you would consider an excellent Christian? You see, the lesson's on the church, but the truth of the matter is that, is that no church can be an exceptional or excellent church without excellent people. If all it has is mediocrity, if all it has is people who go along to get along. So what are some of the qualities? Help me. I think one of the major ones is that they are prayers. Okay, they're people who pray. Okay. Right, they, they pray and read the Bible for, um, for insight, for personal growth, for benefit, and for retention. It's the reason I've changed my approach to saying, I no longer say read five chapters a day or three chapters. If, if each of us will just read one paragraph of the Bible and marinate our brain and take in what that paragraph says, we're better off than hastening through the three chapters and 30 minutes later we remember nothing. If we'll take the same 15 or 20 minutes and really contemplate that paragraph, we leave with something. And that's important, James. Okay, they point others to the Bible, not to themselves. And I know that we do win... We do win people to ourselves, and then we win them to Christ. But there is a very quickly, there is a very quick moving of people to look to the Scripture, to look to Christ. What are some other things? Some of you who are quiet, help me. Faithfulness, Faithfulness steadfastness. That's, yeah, Acts 2 used that term steadfast, and, and that's the concept, as they were constant in this. It wasn't something they did occasionally. Right, very much so. That's a, that's a great lesson. Leadership, that can, and that's part of the overall, Lee. Okay, and that again goes back to some of that fellowship, that caring for each other. It's not just, hail fellow, well met. It's not just, hey, how you doing? Had a good day. Hope you're all right. And walking on. Instead, it's the real connection. It's the real interaction with people. Okay? Somebody else. What about, uh, what about the uh, gifts of the Spirit? The gift of the Spirit. Somebody get that over in Galatians, the gift of the Spirit. Right, there's that expectation of truth, expectation they have something to offer. It's, it's uh, while you're finding Galatians, it's, it's an expectation, I think, too, that if you're a Christian, if you're a believer, if you're a saint of God, you function in the body. You function as part of the body. Uh, it, it was said for decades that the body, that uh, 
human body. They had not figured out what the appendix did. And so they take them out. Um, and I wrote a little chapter one time, the body of Christ has no appendix. Every one of you in here who are born again, it is the intent of God that you function, that you participate, that you be something that is helping the body of Christ be healthy. And so sometimes ask yourself, matter of fact, this morning, ask yourself, how am I functioning? What am I doing in the body of Christ? How am I helping the body of Christ to move forward? Okay, Galatians, read for me. Yeah. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. I was doing real good till they got to that long suffering part. <laughs> Notice something. This is not one tree with multiple variety of fruits. This is singular. This is collectively the fruit of the Spirit. You don't get to say, well, boy, I keep things under control, but I am totally impatient. Fruit of the Spirit includes it all. Again, that's another series of lessons that could be taught. How do you become excellent in anything? Doing it? Study? Evaluation, self evaluation. And sometimes, if uh, self evaluation is something we struggle with, empowering somebody else to evaluate us. Somebody else. Repetition, doing it over and over again. Um, Kansas City Chiefs just won world championship in football. A better, a better illustration is the two decades ago when the New Orleans Saints won it. That's the area I was raised in. The Saints were always an abysmal football team when I was a child. And then they eventually win this, this grand championship of football. How did they do that? How did they become excellent? How did they become the best at what they were? They changed their tactics. They changed their tactics. And you know, in football, there's only a few things you can do, really. You can block, tackle, you can run the ball, you can throw the ball, you can keep other people from running the ball and throwing the ball. They changed their tactics. And their change of tactics, in many instances, it was not a grand change of tactics. It was simply an improving of what they already knew how to do. They were just not doing it as well as they could do it. The Greek word that is translated excel in this in 1 Corinthians and in some other Bible passages there are different words that are used. Abound, increase, exceeding, exceed. One of the things that I guarantee you the coach of a championship sports team says and it's a message that he probably in some cases puts on the wall. No Mediocrity permitted. No mediocrity permitted. No last minute stuff. No thinking, well, it'll do. None of that. Paul didn't say, seek to be satisfying to the edifying it was seek to excel to the edifying of the body he didn't say seek to be average now as a student in high school and college I was a get by student 
and I didn't pursue anything except good solid C's. I had friends who sought to excel. I commend and honor them for that. I wish I'd had a better attitude about it. But I really like recess. And I really like to get home and go shoot the basketball after school. I didn't much like homework and studying. Anybody relate to that? I was never an excellent student. You know what? A teacher never said to me, okay, Carlton, chemistry. Part of what you're to do is to learn that table of elements. But I tell you what. You are so good at recess that I've decided I'm going to give you a B. If I wanted to excel, if I wanted the grade, I had to put in the work to get the grade. We're never labeled excellent. We never become any of that. Now, I'm going to pick on the music team, and Tina's going to, either be happy or very, very sad, but uh, it's just a good and simple, simple target. I, I remember being in a church service setting one time, and I, I, was, I was in a role of responsibility, and this was not going good. We had uh, soloists who sang songs that sounded good on the radio, but there was no way to worship God with them. So we just sat there. We just sat there like we were listening to the radio, stomping our foot maybe. But there was no way to praise God. Then we had a duet of guys get up one Sunday night when Sunday night was a big thing and they were scheduled to sing a duet and, and uh, their song was repeated into infinity it seemed. It was repeated until I got up and said, I've had enough mentally. It's lamp lighting time in the valley. Well, what does that mean? <laughs> it's lamp lighting time in the valley. It's lamp lighting time in the valley. And it just went on and on. And I'm waiting for the next course, the next something. Never happens. Finally, my bow, it's time to preach. Enough lamp lighting. How do you excel? How do you excel in the realm of music? Well, first of all, in this church environment, and I see this as Tina prepares herself for Sundays, pray about what is going to be sung. And here's the deal. If you don't pray, it shows up to anybody who has even a thimble full of spirituality. Second thing that had to be coached at times was be where you're supposed to be. Ready to do whatever you're going to do. I preached a camp meeting in a district somewhere. And when they would get through with praise, the entire praise team, the singers, musicians, everybody, would leave the platform. They were in a big old high school, a big old college auditorium, and they would go sit all the way on the back row as far from the platform as you could get. And so they'd leave, and whoever's leading the service say, we need some music for, well, I would take the offering. Well, they come traipsing back up. And then when that's done, they go back to the back pew. Finally get around to me preaching, and I need altar music, and here they come. 100-yard walk. Wasn't quite that far, but it was a long way. Be where you're supposed to be. And my approach in pursuing excellence in this was that if the person was not at the platform when it was time for their song, we just moved on. We just acted like it wasn't on the schedule. They can sing another time or not. Because the main thing here, we got to have our act together. We need to be doing our best for God. Third thing that I've had to teach at times is that song that makes the hit parade doesn't make it a song anybody can praise God to. We're never up here as entertainers. 
I'm not up here as an entertainer. We're here to inspire others to participate in praising the Lord Jesus Christ. And then I'd say, say something only if you know you have a word from God. Otherwise, the schedule says, sing. I've seen people go off on rat chases. Talking about their ingrown toenail and just crazy stuff. And then they get around to singing. And I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, oh, Jesus, God, get us out of this mess. You can say, I don't like sloppy. I don't like half done. You invite Norm and I over for supper, don't bring us any TV dinners. We want good stuff now. If you don't cook good, we can give you the names of several places that deliver. Have your stuff together, I'd tell them. Know what key it's in and have practiced that song with the music. Don't look over at them and say, I'm going to try something new. I think it's going to be in such and such a key and mm, 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 a little higher, a little lower. And my deal as a pastor was this, because seek to excel, then have it together. We won't do this again for a while. You say, well, that's harsh. That's hard. No, it's not. This is about winning the loss. This is about those out there who are watching, those spectators You know what? When we're sloppy, Satan says, "Uh uh-huh, I like that. Know the words. If you need the words printed, that's not excellent. Sit rather than sing. A couple of weeks ago in Boston, three weeks now, I guess, a young man had a part in the service, and he did well. But he could have done better. The problem he had was he used the same throwaway words over and over again. Words that took time. Words that didn't add one thing to the service or what was going on. After church, again, remember... I told him how good he had done, and then without telling him anything else, I said, and if you want to do better, you go home and you listen to or watch. You're part of this service. And the next time I'm here, you tell me what you learned from watching yourself. Oh, pastor, you offended him. No. No. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you for caring enough about me that you want me to really do what I do for God well. You know, you know one of the things that we've overlooked in the body of Christ is this idea of exhortation. It's coaching. Coaching. When we excel, we exceed expectations. Jesus fed the multitude, and there were 12 basketfuls left over. Wow. The church, in this manifold wisdom of God, is to exceed expectations. Since Sam became a diesel mechanic, there have been quite a few innovations in mechanics and in diesel engines, I have no doubt that he has read manuals, that he has been to some training sessions and and classes. Why? Because if you're going to stay excellent, you have to keep working toward excellence. Great saints excel. Now, I didn't get through, and I will be here, the Lord willing, next Sunday. So I will finish this. Any questions or comments in our nine seconds?
That'll be a quick question and a quick answer. Let's stand together. Father, I pray that the spirit of excellence can become part of our way of thinking, that, that God, from the top to the bottom, left to the right, every person, every person, every person can say, I want to serve the Lord Jesus Christ, not halfway. I don't want to do it just to get along or get by. But God, I want to be used of you, and I want to impact those around me, and I want it to be said in in uh, uh, that setting where Satan is watching and all of his followers, I want it to be said, watch out for him, watch out for her. They've got their act together for God. I believe that it can and will be so. We claim it by faith in Jesus' name. Everybody say amen. Thanks so much for being here with us today. One thing we truly value at Calvary is community. And whether today is your first time joining us or Calvary has been your church for years, we truly want to connect with you. Make sure to stay connected with us throughout the week online at springfieldcalvary.church and on Facebook. We believe God has something unique to say to you and our hope is that you feel His love stronger today than ever before. Thanks again for being with us and have a wonderful day, a wonderful week in the Lord.